Welcome to Women's Perspectives, the podcast that celebrates powerful women who help change the world and strive to shape our future. After decades of women facing barriers to pursuing their aspirations, today we see a rising trend where more and more women proudly embrace their ambition and fearlessly pursue their careers, their families, activism, and so much more. In today's episode, I have a conversation with Mina Harris, a woman whose unwavering ambition has led her to reinvent her career multiple times, from a lawyer, to an entrepreneur, to an author. She has continuously strived to make the world a better place, harnessing every resource on her journey. Welcome, Mina. I'm so happy to have you here. Now, I just wanted to share for anyone who may not be familiar with your work or only familiar with one part of it, you are a lawyer and the founder of Phenomenal Media, which is a Tony award-winning consumer and media brand that elevates the stories of women in underrepresented communities. You're also a number one New York Times bestselling author, publishing four children's books, two about ambitious little girls. And I cannot wait to continue this conversation about the role of ambition and following following our purpose. Thank you so much for being here Thank with us Thank you for today. having me. I mean, it's so good to see you. It's great to see you. It's been a second since we've been able to be in the same place. It has been. It's been some uh, wild few last few years. It has been, but I think this is fitting because I feel like every space that we are in together, there are some common themes yes. about some powerful women in the room talking about supporting one another, talking about making change. And I know for anyone that isn't familiar with your work, I think they've seen your work, they've felt your work, because you've helped with this cultural zeitgeist of embracing women, embracing women's ambition, whether it be the Phenomenal Women Action Campaign or your larger media conglomerate as... as conglomerate? It's a conglomerate now. When you have, when you have co-produced plays, when you've written books, that's officially a conglomerate. <laughs> Almost. I'm, I'm, I'm working towards it. Yeah. But I just wanted to start... Um, by talking about growing up and where you felt like uh, you were poured into so that you could pursue your ambition. What were those moments in your life as a kid and as a young woman where you felt like uh, the encouragement to pursue your ambition? So much, and I know you share this too, is just it goes back to my family and how I was raised. I grew up in somewhat unique circumstances in that it was all women. And it was me, my mom, my aunt, and my grandma. And I saw female power and ambition and purpose on display every single day. I had a front row seat to that. And, you know, Looking back, I joke that it almost felt like the opening scene of the Wonder Woman movie to bring in the entertainment themes here, where they were just sort of like running around, helping each other. In my child's eye, you know, my view looked like they were saving the world. And it just was, you know, it's just sort of all I knew. And um, in that way, it wasn't necessarily something that somebody sat down and said, this is what female ambition means, or this is how we do it. It was just all I knew and all I saw. And so in that way, it was very normalized. And I joked that like the idea of men in power <laughs> and power and equity and the, the, the things that I later, you know, saw in the real world were kind of foreign to me because they had just such an incredible family unit that was constantly emphasizing that for me. But, you know, I think... So much of it uh, goes really to the basics of instilling within children and through your family um, confidence, right? And this idea that, you know, it's, it's corny, but it's true. And it's so important for children to, to believe this, that you can be anything, you can do anything. And, and inherent in that is that you have power, you have voice, right? And you are capable. And so those themes uh, and, and seeing that through the lens of women on display every day was incredibly formative for me growing up and really inspires so much of still who I am and, and what I hope to do in the world. Yeah, I can only imagine because you're absolutely right. I, I come from a similar family where my childhood was defined by seeing women as uh, change makers, as educators, and that really formed what I felt like was possible when I stepped out into the world. And Likewise, not only are you coming from a set of powerhouse women, you're coming from people that are proudly activists and lawyers. Uh, those are two incredible things. And so I'm, I'm curious if you just expand on the role of social justice in your upbringing. I think now more and more we're having this conversation about how everyone can be of service, regardless of their position in the world. Um, but I'm curious about yeah, what social justice has meant to you throughout your career and how you've 
use that definition to define these really powerful career moves you've made? It was just something that was instilled in me at an early uh, time in my childhood. And it was really about, for me, the the lens of the law and, and being around lawyers and public servants and activists and understanding the incredible um, power and tool that the law can be to affect social change. It's about using this incredibly powerful tool, this education, to fight on behalf of our community, to um, fight for their freedoms, for their protections. It's what I, I knew and saw and, and, and really um, inspired me initially to go to law school. And it was about, um, you know, a career that was informed by a commitment to a better world and a more equitable world and using the law as a powerful tool to do that. You know, you, you mentioned that, like, I've reinvented myself. That's a great term to use. I, I, I feel lucky that I've been able to do so many different things, but really starting off, my um, commitment was to social justice, and it still is, but it's about finding different ways of doing that and not necessarily just through the law, right? Each of us has something unique to bring to the table. You as somebody who's in entertainment, right? A young person who has a platform, each of us can play a role in thinking about how we can do our part. And that was, I think, a really um, important value that I was raised with. It's that um, make an impact. You have a responsibility. You have a duty. Any privilege that you have, whether it's through education or rooms that you may be granted access to, you have a responsibility to think about who's not in that room and how do you open the door for them to be in that room, right? And thinking about equity and and really um, the basics of what can I do to, to play a role. So I think we can talk about sort of big change makers and social justice and movement building and and sort of bigger picture um, themes, but it's really about what is the role that each of us as individuals can make in, um, in our own unique way. I love this uh, quote of yours, which also just exudes everything you said now, which is, no one can do everything, but everyone can do something. That so perfectly captures the point that you're making, which is that we are in a time in which we see these incredible moments of big change being made, but sometimes what's ignored is the fact that all of that is possible from many people committing to changes that are possible in their own life, seeing how they can be of service to their communities in small ways, and that's the only way we get these huge ripple effects. And I'd love to discuss how being an author was another way of making change. Because, of course, like you're saying, there's this very clear way through the law that you can be of service to people. But it's really powerful how you've continued to bring forward stories of women's ambition uh, through stories such as uh, the one on Mrs. Claus to uh, stories that are more directly talking to young girls about the words that can sometimes be used to make us doubt ourselves or make us doubt our aspirations. And so, when for you, starting with just when for you did you realize that you had a story to share and it needed to be through a book? Yeah, you know, um, my journey of becoming an author was both pretty unexpected, but also so personal. And I think it does go to this theme of um, making an impact wherever you are. And I became a new parent. I was reading books to my now older daughter and reading classics, you know, Good Night Moon and Hungry Caterpillar. And um, those are lovely, you know, classic uh, children's literature. But at a certain point, I'm like, where are the little black girls that look like her and that look like our family? I didn't see them represented in the books that I had available at that time to read to her. I talk a lot about my grandmother and the inspiration that she was to me as sort of an ordinary person who found these small acts of resistance and impact throughout her life. And, and that's something that was so important that she taught me. And she would say, you know, don't complain about something like do, do something. What are you going to do about it? And I was thinking about her and I'm like, you know what? Um, if I'm not finding the books that I want to read to my children that I think are going to reflect them, you know, and, and show them the representation that they deserve, I'm going to write the darn book myself. You know, as I started to look into that opportunity, I realized that it's it's such a big, um, you know, the, the impact of children's literature is huge. And at the time, I'll share with you, there was a staggering statistic that there were more children's books, as I was looking into this in terms of diversity in children's literature, there were more children's books that had animals as main characters than Black, Latinx, Asian, and Indigenous human characters combined. So there are more children's books that had animals as main characters than people of color, right? Wow. And so, and we've made so much progress since then, and I'm really proud to be a part of sort of this new 
era, right, of diversity and representation in children's books. But back then, um, there were still some, and this was not that long ago, right, to be back clear. Then, as in two seconds ago. Be really. And, you know, had such limited options. And I said, you know, there's something that I can do here. And before my eyes with my, you know, at the time, two-year-old, three-year-old children seeing that, you know, when they read books, they want to be the character in the book, right? They read about a, a jazz musician and they say, mommy, I want to be a jazz musician, right? And, and we have this concept that you can't be what you can't see. But also I saw in real time that whatever they were consuming and whatever they were seeing, they were inspired to be that thing, right? And so they deserve not only to see themselves on on you know, pages of books, but also to be celebrated, to be the main character, not just the side character, right? Or the, you know, the non-speaking character. And so at that time, um, you know, there was uh, an opportunity and I, I decided, you know, I'm going to do this. And um, it was definitely a departure from my day job. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, really being able to tap into that passion, what is now a passion and, you know, purpose around diversity in children's books, um, I did it through such a personal lens and one that was, you know, again, in my own home, right? Right. Um, and then, you know, the, one of my kids' books is literally about two little girls looking in their, literally their backyard, right? Like, what can we do to make this a better place for the children that live in this community? And so really continuing to think about spreading those sort of messages through children's literature and, and understanding children's capacity to understand and, and learn that at such a young age. Mm -hmm. No, that's really a beautiful point that you make because I feel like uh, my parents very much created what we call like an alternate curricula. So in my house, it was whatever character or whatever book uh, centered either our communities or other communities of color uh, were the ones that we read. And it created this precedent for me where I assumed that I belonged in the story. And it wasn't until I really started watching TV at yeah. 13 where I was like, wait, this isn't everyone's experience? Yes. Because I only had The Wiz and yeah. I had a Persian Cinderella oh, story. Man. I need it. Is that a book? A yes. Okay, I have to send. Uh, yes, I need some. I thought book I exchange. exactly. Well, I have to ask you too, Yara, because you had the incredible opportunity to be the first Black Tinkerbell, and <laughs> yeah. I'll share a funny story with you related to this and this idea of like it's all we knew, it's all we saw, and it was normal, and it was the world, our worldview. I. Um, Maybe this is a little controversial, but you just mentioned not being able to watch TV till you were 13. My kids had never seen the original uh, Little Mermaid. And when the Haley, yeah, when Hallie, uh, or Hallie um, Bailey version came out, that I, because you know, there's all this stuff online about like showing it to kids. They were like so wowed and they couldn't believe it. My girls were like, of yeah, course. Cool, yeah, this is how it should be, right? Because that's literally the only mermaid they had ever seen. Anyway, I just, I'm so curious, you know, how that felt for you and how you think about the power of entertainment and the idea that, I mean, you were the first, right? We still, in the year of our Lord 2024, are experiencing first around um, these incredibly powerful you know, images of representation on screen and off screen? Oh, it's a good question. I was definitely, you know, honored to take on such an iconic character. But exactly to your point, I think what I was most excited by was giving kids the experience that I had growing up that was so powerful of the fact that we found those random shows like Happily Ever After, which was Fairy Tales for Every Child, HBO show where they would take classic fairy tales and bring the main characters into a different part of the world or give them a different culture. And so everything that I consumed was about learning more about our global communities and learning more about myself. But still, that took uh, two very active parents. It took a lot of intention. Uh, and so to be able to say that I was a part of a project and that it was coming out at the same time as Hallie, where we were creating this new normal, mm -hmm. where a lot of kids got that experience of watching me on screen, of watching Hallie on screen, because so much of our media is so serious, especially as it pertains to brown and black people, because there are serious things happening in the world. But I think right. what makes me resonate so much with your work is the fact that little kids deserve magic and mm -hmm. wonder. They deserve adventures. And sometimes we uh, undervalue just how formative that is, how formative children Children's media is because this is the next generation of leaders. When well, you said something really important, which is that it took so much intention from your parents and your family, right? And that's the point of, you know, kind of back to the earlier part of our conversation that the world feels big. It can feel overwhelming. It can feel daunting. People want to find a way to do something. The values that I was raised with were about do anything, no matter how small. And it makes an impact, right? And it, ta it's, it's, it takes work and time and commitment 
even something quote unquote as small as you know thinking about how you're raising your kids with all alternate you know curriculum and different looking bookshelves and maybe available to them at their school library. Yeah, right. Um, this is you're a little bit younger than me, but we're still in a time where um, there are efforts to limit kids' ability to go access those sorts of books in libraries or in their schools, right? And so understanding how important so much of this is within the home and what us parents can be doing and really showing up with that intentionality, it's incredibly powerful. Absolutely. And you're an example of, thank right, the, the outcomes that we can all achieve. Oh, thank you. And I, I mean, one thing that I was just so excited to talk to you about is that you're a part of three generations of powerful women. And something that's always been important to me and my family is this concept of intergenerational exchange, mm -hmm. that we can't have these conversations in a silo. It can't just be Gen Z talking to each other, but right. the power of also what we have to learn from one another. And so, you know, I'm curious as somebody that uh, is an entrepreneur in your own right, but comes from lawyers and activists and raising two future world changers. Uh, how has that influenced your work? How has that influenced your journey constantly being in community with every generation of women? Yeah, I mean, I think that there, as you said, it's, you know, it's it's mutual learning and understanding. And um, there's so much to learn from the next generation. I mean, I'm so inspired by um, so much of what Gen Z and your generation has been able to disrupt and um, to show sort of new ways of doing things and frankly, rejecting a lot of the things that I think my generation was burdened with um, and and the generation before that, right? And I think that, you know, to take as an example, one theme that I talk a lot in my, I talk about a lot of my books is ambition and female ambition. And something that I think, you know, has typically or can be used as a negative against women, right? She's ambitious. She's, um, you know, power hungry, right? right? The connotation is you're doing too much. Exactly. Or, you know, stay in your lane. You can be ambitious, but not too ambitious. And we, for a, a long time, have this sort of one dimensional view of ambition is really tied to career or, you know, like this, the girl boss, right? And that was sort of this like archetype for female ambition yeah. that I think Gen Z has really in many ways um, allowed us to understand um, is one dimensional and limiting. And that ambition, as an example, is not something that has to be um, limited to career, right? So when I think about the next generation, not only who I'm raising, but also learning from um, young people, is that it's sort of defining things however you want and being able to do things on your own terms and not being burdened or pressured by the generation that came before you. And so, you know, in parenting, I think about this a lot where I think we're, I, I always was the person to say, what do you want to be when you grow up? You're going to be a future change maker. And that's great, right? There's a, there, there is something to instilling that confidence and that power. I also sometimes worry about pressure of, of, and putting that on, you know, my kids and letting them have the, you talk about sort of just joy and freedom and curiosity and imagination and getting to just enjoy Tinkerbell, right? And not have to always be doing this sort of serious stuff, that that is incredibly important too, right? And not um, pressuring, you know, kids to define ambition as what I did or what my mom and aunt did, right? And to really be able to forge their own path, but also have that confidence and, and feeling of power that, you know, they are, um, they can do whatever they want, frankly. And so I think, I, and there's a lot that even I myself am, am unpacking in terms of, right, the pressures I may put on myself um, to be ambitious or to be a change maker, what that looks like. Starting with, you know, I mentioned um, I, I was a, or you know that I'm a recovering lawyer. And it took me a really long time to realize that I had another, I think, calling and another, you know, path that I could pursue. What do you think gave you the courage to make that jump? Because, you know, some people may think if you have the guts and the skill to get through law school, you can do absolutely anything. And while that's true, I can imagine there was still some nervousness around finding a different career path or, or honoring those other instincts and desires that you had. I love that, honoring those desires. Yeah, I mean, you know, it was not only scary, I also had student debt. Uh, so, That's you know, a very I, real thing. Yeah, I, I went to my, I, I went into law school, you know, inspired by what I saw around me in terms of the, as we talked about earlier, the, the power of the law to affect social change. I wanted to go to law school to enter a career of public service. And as I graduated, I had all the student debt and I needed to go to a corporate law firm to pay off. 
so suddenly student loans. it's not just the work of being of service, but you had to think of the practicalities exactly. of this debt. Exactly. And, and to that point, it's a privilege to be able to say, oh, I just want to make a career switch or I want to try something different. And I didn't have that opportunity at that time. And so it took a while. Um, and for me, it was really about continuing to honor, you know, both that those values of having an impact, which at the time I was sort of always doing on the side, right? Phenomenal. What was previously the Phenomenal Woman Action Campaign, the first iteration of what I'm now doing, it was like a side a side hustle is very familiar to this generation, right? So I can, can I still use that term? Um, it was something that I was I was always engaged in, but it was sort of outside of my nine to five. And so it was really about figuring out, you know, how to first of all learning that you know these are my passions and this is something that I would like to try to figure out how to pursue as a full time career. Um, but that's a scary, daunting thing. And and so to answer your question, um, honestly, it was my first kids book. It was this like really personal project. I thought I'd write one book and then go back to my, you know, regular life. And and it ended up really just opening up an entire world of possibility that I never could have imagined. And again, it started from such a personal place about, you know, reading these books to my children. Um, but it ended up being that sort of concrete thing that I needed to just like take the leap and say, you know what, I'm going to pour myself into this. This is my passion. I have purpose. I really care about these issues of diversity and inclusion in children's books. And by the way, this was pre-book banning, right? Who could have known? Right. It's only gotten, well, I shouldn't act like book banning is new. Just but it's gotten increasingly more important because, like you're saying, we were in this time in which there was this feeling of stability mm -hmm. that diversity and inclusion was here to stay and that we had yet to witness the constant challenges that we'd face to suddenly seeing even classic literature suddenly Absolutely. being banned and taken off our shelves. You know, it was really, I think, the power of, of storytelling, the power of representation, understanding that when you make space for these stories to be told, for them to be seen on the page, on screen, on stage, that makes room for more of them. Uh, and that really allowed me to really hone my my purpose. And so, yeah, it was really kind of just such an incredible gift, um, both becoming a parent, but also really being driven by, you know, what can I do in this space to make it a little bit better? Starting with my own bookshelf, my own children's, you know, bookshelf, and then realizing that, you know, there's so much more that can be done and so much of a bigger impact that I could be making as a kids book author. That was really what was a driving force for me to be able to take that leap. I have to emphasize again that I was in a place of incredible privilege that I could leave a corporate job to go become a children's book author and all the stability that I had, right? And the financial stability, and that's not available to everyone and it should be for us to be able to explore our passions and our, you know, purpose um, in and outside of work. And so that's something that I think about a lot too, just, you know, allowing all of us to be able to have that opportunity. And, and so many people, I think, um, have those desires. But, you know, we have our sort of day-to-day, -day, you know, things that we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. I think purpose is such a, a beautiful space to land our conversation, which has gone by way too quickly yeah. for me. But I had just wanted uh, to quickly, quickly, quickly talk about uh, this incredible point that you made, which is that purpose can blossom so many incredible things. And at times, uh, opportunities that we may not even expect are right for us and the importance of staying open. As an author, people, of course, recognize the phenomenal shirts, but also as a co-producer of a play of a Tony Award-winning Strange Loop, which is incredible, by the way. These are all such interesting ventures. And I think in talking to you, it's really clear to see the kind of mission statement behind it all. But I would love to ask you, how do you allow your purpose or your sense of mission to define what the next move is mm -hmm. or what feels authentic or right to you? For media and entertainment, uh, as we talked about earlier, it's about not just, you know, representation in terms of who's on screen, right? Who's getting opportunities off screen? Who's getting funding to make stories? There's just an entire ecosystem and institution behind it that, you know, as with most institutions in our society have inequity and thinking about equity constantly. It's something that is, you know, sort of in my DNA. It's in the DNA of our company. I can imagine your perspective as a lawyer gave yes. you, you know, insight that even some people in entertainment were just getting to of the importance of institution and infrastructure and right. how our infrastructures define what we can even make and what we can even begin to change. Exactly. And, and we've made so much progress, as we talked about, you know, in children's literature with diversity on screen, first black Tinkerbell yeah. sitting right in front of me. Yeah. 
Uh, but there's just so much more work to do. And so really just the power of storytelling, of media, of representation, and being able to grow that impact um, across these different spaces is what drives me. And we talked earlier about, you know, the intentionality of your parents, right? Just putting those books in your hands. It's the same thing as just carrying that with you and everything that you do and really having it embedded in your worldview and constantly showing up with that, you know, intention and with that point of view. Um, and I think, people like us, uh, if I can say that, who were sort of raised in families that really truly instilled that within us every day. I think it can kind of come more naturally, but, you know, it takes it takes work. It takes intention. It takes really thinking critically about, you know, uh, what, what, what role can I play and what are the outcomes that I'd like to see and really committing to that. And so that's, you know, who, who I am and, and what we are and what I hope to continue growing. Well, thank you for this gift of sharing your journey, of sharing your sense of purpose, because I, I think these conversations are a part of uh, sharing the power of even the homes we grew up in with the world around us is, is opening these conversations and opening these doors. So thank you. Thank you. It's so um, fun to be with you and I'm so excited to just have this opportunity. You no, know, likewise. And I, I cannot wait. You know, we will be sitting in the audience on Broadway oh, this season. Oh, Tony. It's very yes. soon. Thank I you, it. Yara. It's so good to see you. So good to see you. And I, I'm sure the next space that we... Uh, come together in will be equally as interesting. I know. <laughs>